Thank you, Danny. First revival service I ever preached, and we had a little bit of revival in it, surprisingly enough, was when I was 19 years old and I was invited to a little uh, church of the, a little community in West Virginia to a church of the brethren. And uh, I had met the pastor there and had made a good friendship with his son, and he didn't have anybody else to invite. I think he felt sorry for me and wanted to give me a chance. And I went to went to Arborvale, West Virginia with three sermons and was planning to be there three nights and the Lord stayed with us for three weeks. <laughs> so I had to grow up quick and I didn't go night and day like we're accustomed to in this community but, but people were nice enough to come back at night anyway and the Lord showed up most of those nights. But uh, I remember there was this old West Virginia hillbilly sitting on the front row, had three or four teeth. And uh, I mean, he, he was an old guy, but boy, he, he was full of, full of fire and full of the love of Jesus. And I'd get to preaching and he'd say, that's good preaching, good preaching. I don't care where it comes from, that's good preaching. <laughs> it's good singing, Danny, good singing. It's great to, great to be back with you uh, tonight. Um, I don't know when I have in my life enjoyed preaching and teaching uh, more than, than I am right now, just in these days. It's been very precious. I had the privilege of spending the weekend in Florida with three congregations on Saturday and one primary congregation that I, I uh, ministered with on Friday uh, and Saturday and Sunday. But the Lord was so gentle in the way He moved among that congregation of godly older folks, and, uh, and, and there was a deep, deep hunger for God and uh, a real responsiveness to God's Word. And, you know, we're seeing that everywhere. In every generation, we're seeing this hunger. You know, vacuums and voids are uh, one of Satan's greatest tools, but he always overplays his hand because vacuums and voids always provide receptacles for the Holy Spirit to, to fill. And, uh, and so it was very, very rich. I got in the car yesterday afternoon and made it to Atlanta last night and made it here today with a great deal of, of just anticipation and joy and desire to see all of you. So thank you all for being here. This, it's a wonderful privilege for me to get to know you. Uh, and hopefully for you to get to know me in my heart. Because God's doing good things at the Francis Asbury Society. And uh, some new initiatives that we'll be rolling out and talking about very soon that, that we hope are going to make a real difference. Especially for the local church. And, uh, and so we're real thrilled about that. And we'll be, we'll be telling you more uh, here in the next few weeks. So let's go to Malachi. Tonight, where'd we end up last week? I, I forgot. Okay. I didn't forget, and obviously neither did you. So let's go to Malachi 1. We ended in verse 5. Let's go to verse 6 tonight. Now we're going to be looking at Malachi, uh, this first chapter, 6 verse, to Malachi chapter 2 and verse 9. Uh, <clears throat> this is a place where the folks who added the chapter and verse divisions hundreds of year af years after the original text were written, just didn't get it right. And there are a few places like that. The end of, <laughs> end of 1 Corinthians 10 into the first verse of 1 Corinthians 11 is another place. There, there are a few places like that where, where, where they just missed it. Uh, thankfully for them, they were not operating under the same inspiration of the Holy Spirit that the, uh, uh, that the penman... Uh, were who, who wrote the sacred text, but uh, we're looking tonight at the second symptom of a slipping heart. We've talked about how Malachi addresses the people of God here at the end of, of the Old Testament period. There's going to be about 400 years of silence, a bit more than 400 years. We date Malachi to the mid-fourth century B.C. 
Um, we believe that for a number of reasons, largely because of what we're going to be addressing tonight. Just to, to recover these steps for those of you that may have missed a week, um, the children of Israel have come back, the people of Israel and Judah have come back from their uh, captivity, their bondage in Assyria and then in Babylon. They have returned to their homeland under the gracious hand of uh, the decree of uh, Cyrus, king of Persia. The, uh, the temple has been rebuilt. The word of God was rediscovered, revival under Josiah. And then we, we read in, the, in Nehemiah and Esther about the reestablishing of the uh, sacrificial system of worship in Israel. And all of that came with a great deal of expectation that God was about to do, having brought them back from their captivity, that God was about to do what they had believed God was going to do. That which had sustained them in, uh, in their captivity was about to come to pass. But as the years went on after they returned, they fell back into routine. And how easily we do that, right? And we're going to talk about that tonight and what an offense that is to God. And so um, as we look tonight at, at this second symptom, the first symptom of the slipping heart uh, is questioning the love of God. We talked about that last week. Lord, you don't love me because the events of my life don't prove it. And God says, oh, yes, they do. Let me remind you. So then we get to... to uh, Verse 6 here in chapter 1, and uh, the Lord says this through the prophet Malachi, A son honors his father, and a slave his master. If I am a father, where is the honor due me? Says the Lord Almighty. It is you priests who show contempt for my name. Now, we're, we're going to look at four areas of development throughout the text that we're studying tonight. And the first is what we simply will call God's complaint against Israel here in this section of Malachi's prophecy. And you remember from both our overview and from last week, the methodology of the prophet's argument, speaking as a messenger of God to the people, is to uh, make a statement to which the people then respond in disbelief. Um, or they respond with a question back to the Lord. Last week, I have loved you, says the Lord. Oh yeah, how have you loved us, says, says Israel. Well, tonight we begin with uh, two questions. They're a statement beginning here in this text that, that a father uh, is honored by a son, by a child, and that a master is honored uh, by a servant. But where is my honor? says the Lord. So there's a question. And then we find um, that the Lord then delivers to Israel this diagnosis of their heart that is slipping away from Him. And He says to them, you priests are offering contemptible sacrifices. You hold contempt in your heart against Me. And then of course their response will be, what do you mean we have contempt against you? And uh, so in this first section, we're going to talk tonight about, uh, about God's complaint. And we look at these first words here where Malachi says, A son honors his father and a slave his master. But if I am your father, where is the honor due me? Now the word honor there is a powerful Hebrew word. And again, you remember I told you last week, I work in transliterations not in the original pronunciation. Is that all right with you? John Oswalt can give you the original. He can get everybody on the front row wet. <laughs> but uh, I work with the transliterations. And the word here is a word I bet you're going to recognize, and we would transliterate it like this. This is the word for honor. Let's say that word together, kabod. Let's say it, kabod. Kabod. It is the word for honor. Now it's also translated uh, by another word that we find probably to be more familiar in the scripture, 
in terms of the translation of this original Hebrew. And uh, the word honor is also translated glory. God's glory is God's kabod. God's honor is God's kabod. God's honor and God's glory are therefore, in effect, synonymous. A son honors, the Lord says, his father. A son honors his, his father, but where is my honor, says the Lord. Now, I, uh, as I get older, I find myself talking more and more about my dad. You heard me do that last week. I, I doubt there'll be any one of these weeks that I don't say something about my dad. And it really isn't intentional. It's not an intentional attempt to honor my dad. But it's because of the weight of my dad's character. It's because of what he allowed God to do in his life. It's because of the impact of his character upon me that I am naturally drawn to show honor. And the longer I live, the more I honor him because the more I am aware of the wisdom that brought weight to his life. This word uh, kabod literally means weight. It's translated honor and it's translated glory, but it means weight. Now when we think of weight, that's W-E-I-G-H-T, not W-I-A-T. W oh, oh, sorry, W-A-I-T. Go back to school, Bill. I think that one, that one is probably a go back to sleep, Bill. You'll give me one, you'll give me one pass tonight, right, since I've been on the road. Um, but this idea of the weight or the glory or the honor of God, which is held forth here by the prophet, can really be discussed from two different angles that we would be very familiar with when we think of weight. Weight has to do with substance. When I graduated from high school, I weighed 146 pounds. Everybody was worried about why I couldn't gain weight. And uh, I, have, I have gained weight as I've gotten older. I hope in more ways than one. There is more substance to me now than there was then. And so we think of weight in terms of, of substance. And uh, um, we think of a person that has substance. They're, they're a person with weight. We use the term gravitas. They walk in a room and you notice them. Maybe it's their character. It's not to be interpreted in terms simply of charisma or personality, but they have gravitas because of what they are, who they are, what they've accomplished, what they've done, and we hold them in reverence because they deserve it. Now they're human beings and they're flawed. Um, the Lord is not. He is neither human nor flawed. So it, it makes it really an inadequate, um, an inadequate illustration in a lot of ways. But, but we think of gravitas when we think of weight, a person who has honor or a person who is given glory because of the substance of their life. Um, you can also, though, look at it in another way. We're going to look at that in a minute. And a weight is an instrument of measure or a scale. And the use of the Hebrew in that context talks about value. Value. So we can think about glory, kabod, the honor due unto God as being about God's substance and being about value. And we're going we're gonna to look at that uh, as well here in, uh, in just a, a minute. Well, let's think about the use of this term kabod in a very familiar period of Israel's history, the glory of God. Now, the glory of God, um, we know, was uh, represented many times, demonstrated many times in the Old Testament. 
through the pillar of fire that led the children of Israel through the wilderness. Um, and also in an object. What was that object? The ark. The ark of God that went before the people into battle. And in that ark, you remember, was the law. There was a pot of manna. And there was Aaron's rod that budded from the book of Exodus that were inside the, the ark. And the ark represented the glory of God because as long as the people were giving reverence to God and as long as the people were acknowledging God's substance and God's value in their lives, wherever the ark went, the glory of God went and victory came. But if you ever dare to presume that simply because you pick up the ark and carry it into battle, you're going to be victorious. You have a rude awakening ahead of you, as do the children of Israel in uh, 1 Samuel chapter 4. You remember the story. It simply begins by saying, And Israel determined to wage war against the Philistines. And it says that they camped where? At Ebenezer. You remember that term? Here I raise my Ebenezer. Ebenezer is a place of remembrance. It's where God has done something special or significant. We build an altar or we, we identify an Ebenezer, that place that we go back to to remember God's faithfulness. And so to me it's more than ironic that the children of Israel as they presumed to go into battle against the Philistines thinking that all they had to do was carry the ark with them were camped on the night before the battle in Ebenezer. They thought because God had done it before, God would do it again. All they had to do was go through the same motions. And so they carried the ark into battle, and what happened? They were soundly defeated. The ark was captured by the Philistines, and the two sons of Eli, Hophni and Phinehas, or Phinehas, however you want to pronounce that, were both killed. When the word got back to Eli, who was old and had gotten heavy, he was a man of substance as well, and he was a man of great substance, Eli heard the news that his two sons had been killed and he, and he fell over backwards and he died. About the same time, Phinehas' um, wife was giving birth. She was led into premature labor by the shock of the news that her husband had died. And the people who were there tried to console her. All this is contained in 1 Samuel 4. They tried to console her and said, Don't worry about the ark. You've just had a son. Now think about that. Don't worry about the glory of God. You've just experienced the most weighty, the most honorable experience that a human being, that a mother will ever have. But she knew in her heart that there is no substitute for the honor due unto the Lord. And so that child for all of his days would bear the name Ichabod, well, it turns into an H, but Ichabod, which simply means no glory. The glory is gone. Now, the glory wasn't gone because the ark had been stolen, though that was the assumption many in Israel made because they had forgotten that their victory, they had forgotten that God's presence among them was not because of this wooden box overlaid with gold, but it was because of the reverence and the honor that they had paid unto the Lord. And one of the ways that they paid honor unto the Lord was through a system of sacrifice. And in the sacrificial system, we read about it, of course, all through uh, the Pentateuch, Exodus to, to uh, uh, really Leviticus, Leviticus, we see the, the instructions for the building of the tabernacle. And, in Exodus, we see the first sacrifice of, of uh, the lambs who were slain and the blood uh, over the doorpost uh, there in the area of Dothan in the land of Egypt when, when the Passover came. The Lord delivered them from their 400 years of bondage and set them on their journey through the wilderness toward the promised land. And we find then this system of sacrifice that had been instituted. And in that system of sacrifice, innocent animals um, 
had their blood shed in accordance with the law of God in order to cover the sins of the people. It's very interesting. If I've said this before, I apologize. But it's very interesting. An anthropologist, if, you've, if you're an anthropologist here, please don't correct me in front of everybody. Um, there may be more recent evidence. At some point I read in the last not too many years, that in all but one or two societies in the history of the world, anthropologists have been able to discover that every people who have ever existed instinctively knew to institute some measure of blood sacrifice for the forgiveness of their God, whoever that God was, or the gods. There was always blood involved. Now I wonder why that is. You think God was setting humanity up? Well, he was certainly setting up Israel through the sacrificial system so that Israel would discover through the law that they were incapable of keeping it, and they would discover through the sacrificial system that as long as they reverenced and honored the Lord by following God's instructions on those sacrifices, that uh, they would be freed from their sin. And on that Day of Atonement, that scapegoat would be led out into the wilderness and the people would gather and they would cheer and they would shout as they got the visual of their sins being carried away, right? Uh, that's what the Psalms say, that our sins have been carried as far as the east is from the west. That's, that's that image. Well, here's the problem. If you're going to properly honor God, if you're going to reverence God, if, if our sins are going to be covered by the sacrificial system, then we have to bring God the kind of offering God requires, which is the very best we have to give. Now, you all know this. You've heard John Oswalt and so many others teach it here in this community for so many years. You, you were not afforded the opportunity to go into your flock or into your herd and pick the animal that you were going to have to get rid of, put down, or sell cheap anyway. You had to give your very best. And in doing that, you were not only offering your best to God, but you were demonstrating reverence for God and trust in the reality that God was going to make up for you in what was going to be lost by what that animal could provide for your family, whether it was in the price of sale or whether it was in, uh, in what, it, what it produced itself. And so here's God's complaint against Israel and particularly against Israel's priests. You've despised my name, says the Lord. You've held me in contempt because you haven't honored me. Well, how have we done that, they ask. Because you've brought to me Crippled and lame sacrifices. Crippled and lame sacrifices. <clears throat> We're going to talk about value here in just a minute, but I want to go back to this second reference the Lord makes, not just to honor, but to respect here in Malachi 1.6. A son honors his father and a slave his master. If I'm a master, where, uh, if I'm a father, where is the honor due me? And if I am... Your master, where is my respect? This is another word, and it's the word we would translate fear. Fear. But it's not the kind of fear that comes with terror. It's not a fear of punishment. It's the word for fear that would be used for being afraid that you have offended someone who is of value to you. Now, back to my dad. I remember I got one spanking from my dad in my entire life. And my dad was an attorney, and he had a very high IQ. He was a, kind of a country lawyer in some respects. He grew up in a very small town, but he was brilliant. And uh, he was also a, a bit of a psychologist. So I had a buddy over to spend the night one night, and we sneaked out of the house, got into a little trouble, and... Uh, the guy whose car we messed up knocked on our door at 8 o'clock the next morning. We thought we'd gotten away from it, uh, with it, and he knocked on the door the next morning because we came running jubilantly down the street having 
thought we had uh, outrun the fellow. What, what I didn't know was that he had turned into our neighbor's driveway because he was a friend of our neighbor's and he saw these two kids running down the street celebrating that they'd gotten away. We were throwing tomatoes at cars on the highway going by and we'd hit his windshield. So he knocked on our door at 8 o'clock and I heard my dad go to the door and I heard this man say something and my dad said, really? I'm so sorry to hear that. How bad is the damage? Uh, I'll be glad to take care of it. I'm very sorry and I'll, I'll take care of my son as well. Now, that was one morning I really was not excited about getting out of bed. <laughs> but I thought to myself, if dad will just go ahead and do it, I can go out and play and get on with my day. I'll, I'll face my consequences. My dad was so brilliant. So I got up. He acted like nothing had happened. We went up and had some breakfast. And my dad asked me a few questions. What would you do last night, son? Oh, we were watching movies. Yeah. Mm -hmm. He used the Malachi method on me. And uh, he said, you sure you didn't sneak out last night? Well, I, by that time, I already knew I'd been caught. So I said, yeah, Dad, I, I did. And uh, I said, I guess I'm in trouble. And he said, well, he said, here's what I want you to do. It's Saturday. I want you to go out today, and I want you to play all day, and I want you to have a great time. I want you to enjoy your friends. And at 5 o'clock, I want you home. You're going to get a spanking. <laughs> you think I enjoyed myself? <laughs> But as I think about that as an adult and place myself again in, into the psyche of that 12 or 13 year old boy who was awaiting that spanking all day, you know what hurt me the most? I had disappointed my dad. I disappointed him. You know, when we look at the Ten Commandments, we remember that these are not just rules. What, what they uh, illustrate for us is what God values. And the first four are about our relationship with Him, and the next six are about our relationship with others. That's why when that lawyer said to Jesus, what's the greatest commandment in the law? He said, love the Lord your God with all your heart and soul and mind and love your neighbor as yourself because in that you have fulfilled all the law. He wasn't referring to all 613 laws that, that we got in the Old Testament, but he was referring to those 10, the Decalogue that, that Israel considered to be the representation of what God valued and what he wanted from his people. So here's what we must always remember, and it's what the priests in Israel forgot. And it's a symptom of a slipping heart. Holiness is not about whether or not we break laws. Holiness is about whether or not we break hearts. Because as a parent, when I made a rule for my child, and when my children now make rules for their children, they are not trying to take the joy from those young ones. They're trying to protect them. They're demonstrating love for them, and even more than that, they are demonstrating to them what they value. What we value in this house is blank. And because we value blank, the rule is this. And when you break the rule, yes, there's punishment. But the greatest punishment embedded in the law is that when you break it, you despise the values of the one who gave it. And the priests in Israel had gotten lazy. At least it started with them getting lazy. And after we are lazy long enough, we get licentious. Laziness becomes a lifestyle, and the more we get away with a lifestyle of laziness, the more we begin to revel in our laziness. We become experts at it. 
So we have God's claim, we have God's charge against Israel and, and uh, the priest, and now we have um, the priesthood's contempt. How, how, had they, how had they been despising the Lord? Well, we read this here in, in Malachi 1. By saying the Lord's table is contemptible when you offer blind animals for sacrifice. Is that not wrong? When you sacrifice lame or diseased animals. Is that not wrong? Try offering them to your governor, Malachi says, right there in verse 8. Now the word governor is a very interesting word because Malachi does not choose a word in Hebrew for a Hebrew official. I mean, the role of the priest was twofold, right? First, the priest, the sons of Levi, the tribe of Levi, Levi arbitrated when there was disagreement about the law. And they also stood in the middle. A priest is one who stands in the gap. A priest is one who builds a bridge from the law to mercy, who stands in the gap between people and God. But when the priest is corrupt in their heart, where do the people have to go? There's nowhere. And so the Lord says to the priest, he said, offer it to your governor. Who's the governor? This is actually a Persian word which is used in Malachi 1.8, which is translated governor. Because the, the illustration that the prophet is giving to the people is if you were back in captivity and you were invited to a king's dinner, in that culture everybody would bring something to contribute. Now, if you're invited to the king's table, what are you going to bring? You're going to bring leftovers? No. You're going to it's you're going to bring your best dessert. You're going to you're going to bring um, you're going to bring the best meat. You're going to bring the the best vegetables or dates or whatever it may be. Because you've been invited to have dinner with the king. And he says, try taking that to your governor. See if he'll accept it. Try taking that to Uncle Sam when the tax bill comes due. I love the story about the guy that uh, got to feeling really guilty about cheating on his taxes. And so he wrote a, he, he wrote a letter for, uh, wrote a check for $600 and wrote a letter to the IRS and confessed. And he said, I've been feeling really bad about this, so I want to send you $600 toward my tax bill. And he said, uh, and if I don't feel any better by next week, I'll send the other $600. <laughs> oh, <wow>. <laughs> <laughs> so this contempt is expressed in bringing to the Lord that which is worth nothing. One of my favorite verses of Scripture and one of my favorite stories in the Scripture comes from 2 Samuel 24. And it's when King David was tempted to number the armies, the number of soldiers in the army. The Lord explicitly told him, don't number the army. You don't need to know how many soldiers you've got. I'll, I'll defend you. But David numbered the army. He wanted to hedge his bets. And the Lord brought a plague on the people. And David went back to the Lord and he confessed. And the Lord said, I want you to go to Arana, the Jebusite. And I want you to confess to him what you've done. And I want you to buy from him the threshing floor in order to make your sacrifice unto me. And then I will relent. I will remove the plague. Well, you know, when God is working us over, there's always somebody that loves us and they care about us and they want to let us off the hook. And somebody said to David, said, well, you know what, David, I'll, I'll buy the threshing floor. That'll at least take some of the burden off of you. And, and what does David say to that? He immediately responds, 2 Samuel 24, 24, and he says, may God forbid that I ever offer unto him anything that costs me nothing. That's the value part of honor. That's the value part of kabod. That's the standard of measure that comes with the concept of weight. How do we value something? We determine the value of something by what we're willing to give for it. 
Now, I'm not much of an economist. Um, I know enough to be able to manage things, don't worry. Uh, we got great people here who do that for us, Charlie and Gary and, and others. But um, my wife is the saver, I'm the spender. Now, I'm making a confession to you. Don't worry about your money, I promise. What I buy is books. <laughs> and Kim loved it when I got the offer to come with FAS because she knew I would be living away from home part-time. That kind of hurt my feelings at first. Then I realized the reason she was happy was because she knew I'd be bringing half my books with me to Wilmore. She was tired of them cluttering up her house. The value of an object or the value of an experience is determined by the price that somebody is willing to pay for it. I'm going to get off track just a minute here, but you remember what Jesus said in Matthew 13. What time is it? I can't see. Um, Matthew 13, 44 to 46, Jesus uh, told two parables, two short parables. And the one, the first one is the most famous. He says, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant who's seeking for fine pearls. And when he finds one pearl of great price or value, he goes and sells all that he has and he buys it. Now, in many of our traditional evangelical interpretations of that parable, we have said that the pearl of great price is who? It's Jesus. We've got to be willing to give up everything for him. There's only one problem with that. We don't seek for him. He seeks for us. I tell teenagers, don't ever let anybody else determine what you're worth. I'm going to tell you, if you can get out of middle school with your worth intact, it's a miracle. Because there's always somebody trying to tell you what you're worth. The Lord seeks us by grace. It's His desire to look for us. It was, it was not our idea to look for Him. Um, provenient grace is that God seeks for us and readies us and prepares us for, for the opportunity and the ability to respond to Him. And so I believe, and there are others who do too, I mean there are commentators who do, but I'm convinced that when Jesus referred to the pearl of great price, he wasn't talking about himself. The kingdom of heaven is like a merchant seeking fine pearls, who when he finds one of great value, he sells all that he has to get it. I think that is a reference to Jesus, that he who is of ultimate value, giving himself to determine our value. What are we worth? Paul says, 1 Corinthians 6, 20, you are bought with a price. price. What's the price on your head? The price on your head is the value of Jesus. Now, if that won't do something to cause us to go back to God with all of those voices in our life that have tried to tell us what we're worth and what we're not worth, But here's the other side of that principle. Because God has determined our value in the price that Jesus paid to redeem us. When we offer to God anything less than the best we have to give. I'm not talking about performance. I'm talking about the intention of our heart. Whenever we give to God anything less in terms of the attention of our, intention of our heart and the submission of our will, we are devaluing ourselves and the sacrifice of Christ. We are saying to God, God, you are worthless. We despise you. That's the value part of honor.
I wish we had two hours tonight. We don't. But, but let's, let's talk about worship just for a second. We're not, we're not really going to get all the way through these four areas, but I, I'll give you enough you can work on and fill in the blanks yourself. Let's talk about worship. The old English word that's translated worship means worth-ship. W-O-R-T-H. Uh, ship. Worth-ship. Worship is about value. Worship is when we value God for who God is. When we honor God, when we reverence God. And in worship, we come to give to God our all and to give to God our best because that is our, Romans 12, 1, our reasonable service of what? Worship. Now here's God's argument with the priests of Israel. And I believe it's God's argument with priests today. How much worth are you giving God when you steal your sermon off the internet? <laughs> this is how a heart slips. We came to Jesus and His sincere children who loved the milk of the Word. We were fed by the Word of God and we were passionate about the Word of God and we loved the Word of God and we read the Word of God every day and we sought to honor and obey the Word of God, and then we got ordained, and Sunday came every seven days. And somewhere along the line, we read the Scripture in order to prepare our sermons. And then, when we got away with that long enough, we just stole our sermons from somebody else. And God says, when we do that, we despise Him. We are taking the value that God has placed upon us, and we, have, and we have taken the honor and the weight of God's person, and we have despised it because we have devalued it. You see, value is about price. Great story. I love this. It really has nothing to do with what we're talking about tonight, but I just love telling it. And I don't know if it's true or not. I mean, how, do, are any of you aware that not every story preachers tell is true? <laughs> I know all yours are true. Most of mine are, and I'm not going to tell you which are and which aren't. <laughs> but this guy lived in Germany in a house that had been in his family for hundreds of years. And that's hard for us to imagine here, but in, in Europe, that happened. And he was the last of the line, and he was getting old and was having to move into a, another home, and he, he was giving up the property that, that had been in his family all those years, and he had boxed some things up, and among those things was a box of books, and a friend of his stopped by to bid him farewell, and it just turned out that his friend was a, a lover of rare books. So you know what somebody who loves books does when they see a box full of books. He starts looking through it. Gets about halfway down that box and he finds a book in there and he pulls it out and he whoosh, blows the dust off the cover and his eyes get as big as silver dollars and he turns to his friend and he said, you know what this is? And his friend said, yeah, it's a Bible. It's an old one. He said, this isn't just a Bible. He said, this is a Gutenberg original. He said, he only did a few of them. He said, one of these just sold at an auction in France for over $400,000. And you're going to take it and give it away or sell it cheap? He said, yeah, I thought about that. He said, but I, I thumbed through it and I found somebody named Luther wrote notes all over it. So, <laughs> it's not worth anything. See, when, when we grasp the concept that worship is about worth, it's about God's worth, it's about our worth, and what we do every time we gather to worship is we say, God, you have determined my worth by the sacrifice of Christ, and I'll now take all I am and I'll pour it back on you. So we start from square one all over again. But when I give to God less, I'm trying to hold some of my worth for myself. And I devalue Him in the process. I despise Him. 
That's why we can't just plug and play from week after week after week in the bulletin. That's why it's an offense to God when we just scratch out last week and write in this week without any time to pray and confer and work as a team together around. What does God want to say to us this week? How do we prepare an environment, an atmosphere for the presence of God to be evident so lives can be transformed? Are we just going to go through the motions? Now, I, I, know, I know your people are going to get all twisted up if you, if you quit plugging and playing because they like it just the way they like it. But you see, the priests in Israel had despised God because in their irreverence of God, they were no longer willing to take the heat for standing in the gap between God and the people. And when we value opinions, and when we value praise, and when we value affirmation, and when we value attaboys and attagirls more than we do obedience, whatever that looks like, we're despising Him. Now, we'll wrap up with this, and, and I'll just, I just want to cover this, um, just the idea or the concept. Is, so what does the Lord say that we're to do about it? Well, he, he says that we're to reverence Him. In chapter 2 and verse 1, He says, And now, you priests, this warning is for you. No, by the way, He's not just talking to the priests, the Levites, and He's talking to the Levites in Israel here in Malachi, but who are the priests today? We're not just talking about the preachers. We're priests. We have been made priests unto our God, 1 uh, Peter 2.5. Um, I remember I've, I thought I was going to get through my entire pastoral career and only wear a robe one time. And that was when I was ordained and I wore Dennis Kenwall's robe because I wanted to show honor. And then um, after I left St. Louis University, after a two-year break in, in pastoring, I thought I was going to go into teaching, and the Lord called me to a church back close to home, and it ended up being a, a wonderful thing. And I joined that staff as a teaching pastor, and the senior pastor, who was a great friend of mine, thought that somehow the glory of God was tied up in the robe. And, and look, I'm not, I'm not making light of that. I do appreciate the fact that... Um, that, that there are symbols and means of familiarity and that are sacred and set us apart. But for me, and it may not be true of you, but for me and my theology, that's kind of part of the problem. And I just never have been able to understand the sense of talking about the priesthood of all believers with a congregation when I'm dressed up in something different than they are. And and so I had to wear a robe for two and a half years until our senior pastor on Christmas Eve had a 104 degree temperature and he died six months later with leukemia. And our children's pastor, 26 years old, six weeks after David was diagnosed, our children's pastor was killed in a single car accident driving home from her parents' house on a Friday night. And the bishop called. I was the last person in our conference our bishop wanted to do a favor for. I don't want to get into details on why, but um, you probably have some ideas by now. But <clears throat> he called and he said, Bill, you've got to take that church. He said, I've never, I've never appointed an associate pastor to be the senior pastor of the same church in my life and always swore I wouldn't, but you've got to do it. And so we were there another, another four years. But on the first Sunday, I was the senior pastor. I got halfway through my sermon. And I said, wait a minute, folks, i got to do something. <laughs> I just slowly unzipped it, stepped out of it, folded it up real nice, and put it down on the bench. And I said, now let's talk about us all being priests. Again, that's imagery, that's symbol. I'm not in any way saying that a robe is bad or wrong. It's just not authentic for me. 
But here's what the Lord says to Israel. He says, you priest, not just the Levite priest, but us as priests. In the New Testament, Jesus says to us, if you do not listen, if you don't resolve to honor my name, I'll send a curse on you and I'll curse your blessings. Yes, I've already cursed them because you've not resolved to honor me. Actually, the term curse there comes with a definite article. It means the curse and probably refers back to Deuteronomy 28 with the blessings and the curses. My covenant was with Levi, the Lord said in verse 5. A covenant of life and peace. I gave them to him. This called for reverence, and he revered me and stood in awe of my name. This is the only place in the Bible, in the Hebrew especially, where the Hebrew words used to describe reverence and to stand in awe are used together. The term stand in awe means to be wrecked. It means to be rendered um, to a point of incapacity. Our reverence for God renders us so broken by the reality of grace that we are not capable of giving to God anything which is based upon our own value, but only that which is based upon His. It's a great hymn. I want to just close with these lyrics. There's a great hymn that, uh, that I love. And actually, it comes with two, um, two tunes. How many of you can guess which, tune, which hymn that is? Danny probably already is thinking of it. <laughs> Francis Ridley Havergal was born in England in... 1826, I believe, she was the daughter of an Anglican priest. When she was five years old, she gave her life to Jesus. And she was so committed to following Jesus as the lover of her soul that in her teen years, she learned Hebrew and Greek so she could read the Bible in the original language. Now, I know that's because they didn't have Xbox and <laughs> there was no television, there, weren't any, there wasn't any travel ball, there was nothing else to do, right? But her life was not an easy life. She was sickly. She died at 42 years old, body broken. But I, I read recently an excerpt from her journal where she went to a home, invited as a guest one night, and she prayed all day before she went to that home, and she said, God, give me this house. She gave her whole day to God before she went to that meal in that home as a sacrifice to the Lord in prayer. Lord, give me this house. Give me every person in this house. And she wrote in her journals and she said, she said, God answered my prayer because I left with everyone having received a blessing. <laughs> I love that old language for the work of the Holy Spirit people's lives. Everyone had received a blessing. And then she talked about two little girls, the two little girls in the house who she had spent some time with upstairs and had led those two little girls to Jesus. And one of those little girls prayed a prayer when she gave her life to Jesus. And she said, Lord Jesus, this girl was seven, eight years old. She said, Lord Jesus, let me be ever only, all for Thee. Ever, only, all for Thee. It's the last, actually it's the final lyric of the last verse of Take My Life and Let It Be. Lord, let me be ever, only, all for Thee. How easy it is, how easy it is for our hearts to slip. How easy it is to start giving God day-old bread, start giving God leftovers from the fridge. How easy it is to despise Him by devaluing God's sacrifice for us by presuming 
that in giving him less than our all, we can keep any sense of value for ourselves. Mm. May it never be. Let's pray together. Lord God, we love you tonight. We say those words, we love you. Maybe perhaps Malachi would speak back for you and say, oh yes, how have you loved me? Lord, maybe we need to think about that tonight. We all know the gravitational pull of uh, the routine, of the mundane, of the going through the motions. We all know, Lord, the gravitational pull to do the plug and the play. To go to the scripture because we have to have something to say. And then when we're too busy working for you that we don't have time to go to your word, we just take a sermon that someone else sweated over and we preach it. Lord, as your priests, not just those who stand behind pulpits or in front of congregations or who minister the sacraments, but as your priests, as your royal priesthood, as a holy nation. Lord, could we, could we receive enough grace from you tonight that everyone in this room, all of us, starting with me, would be willing to say, Lord, please don't ever let me despise you. And Lord, if I ever start to, please get my attention. Because the only value that we have is the value that has been given to us in the sacrifice of Jesus, who then demands that we give it all back just as the children of Israel could only gather bread for a day, in giving you our all, we are reminded that in giving you our all, we are nothing. But as you replace our all with your all, we become people of value, only to turn around and give it to you again. Lord, we thank you. We love you. Let us learn from these priests in Israel that religion, that routine uh, is no sacrifice, is no substitute for honoring you with our lives. May that be for us in Jesus' name.